How much money does it cost to open a dough commissary in New England? Anthony Allen here, owner of Auto Pizza, has 24 locations, 14 of which are company-owned, 10 franchises, and he makes all the dough for all the locations. He's been gracious enough to give us an opportunity to look inside the dough commissary. We're going to talk about how much it costs, how much it makes, how much dough it makes, and show you all the ins and outs of running one of these gigantic dough commissaries. Take a look with me, and let's get into it. Hi, I'm Anthony Allen. I'm co-founder and owner of Auto Pizza. My business partner Mike and I started Auto in 2009. We currently have 14 corporate units and 10 franchise units. And in 2015, we decided to listen to somebody who knew more than us about Go. And we decided to open up our dough plant here in New Haven. Today, we operate a 10,000 square foot dough plant, producing dough for the 24 units, as well as some gluten-free products for broadline distributed use, and our organic dough ball, which is distributed to about 90 whole food uh, purchase stores, as well as 250 or 300 other smaller markets. Now, follow me. Let's take a tour inside. Came from my business partner, Mike, and I were struggling with what to call it. And our graphic designer, my business partner, Mike, came up with an Enzo, and he loved Enzo. And we looked at that graphically, and it sounded great. Our graphic designer, Mark, came up, he started kind of challenging us. Enzo's good, but you know, you're making Italian pizza. Let's talk about that. And graphically, he came up, we all kind of came up with the word auto, meaning eight in Italian, eight slices, uh, which made some sense. But graphically, the logo, it just sung to us. We had looked at a bunch of things. When I saw the logo auto, it's like, that is it. And the graphic designer basically paid him in pizza because we didn't have any money. <laughs> but when he gave us a logo, he said, "This, we'll put this on your window, our little shop in Maine, and it'll look like you have 10 stores. It'll, it'll give you some some gravitas. And uh, and, and that's why that's how we kind of want to fund it. Gives you a little credibility before you even get started. It felt like it. So this is it. This is uh, this is um, our gluten-free room. So we built this out um, I don't know, uh, around COVID. Um, when I was here last time, you showed me this. I think this was just starting. Yeah, could have been at about the time. Uh, we started auto. We never we didn't have uh, gluten-free. People asked for it. We um, uh, we sourced it out. We found a company in Maine that produced gluten-free shells. We used them. Mediocre product, a lot of breakages, didn't taste very good, tastes like the cardboard in the bottom of the box. Our guy here, Alex, the plant manager, he's a scientist, studied dough, and he said, I can formulate something, give him some parameters, and we did that, and it took about six months to formulate what we use now, tie in a bunch of different products, and we stamped that out, and now we sell that in our shops, and we also sell it to U.S. Foods, it gets shipped out otherwise, and our sales, when we use the mediocre product, initially was three or four percent of our sales were gluten-free, now it's about nine percent of sales. Wow. It's a good product. That's great. So who else do you sell? Do you sell these to any other pizza shops? We do. I don't know who. So it's like Cisco or U.S. Foods yeah, sells it to them as like a... It, it is labeled as auto, so they know it's from us. I yeah. don't know who it is. I wonder if they promote the fact that they make use auto dough. I doubt it. <laughs> Highly <laughs> doubt it. There's a couple spots in Swampska that do use it because Alex would run it off, you know, yeah. deliver it. I don't know if they're still using it, but a bunch of folks do it. That's it's awesome. a good product. So uh, let's walk down here. Yeah. Take a step back. When I bring my kids through here, I'm like, well, investment. I mean, we have to buy every speed rack, every sheet pan, every piece of parchment paper, the fans, the equipment over here, the pallets. It's a huge investment. I was going to say, how much did it cost to set this up? Like if you had to do it all again, how much would it cost you? To I would do it a lot this? differently all again. I probably yeah. wouldn't do it now. I, I don't know if we would do it or not. Yeah. Um, but to do it all over again, let me think about that number. Yeah. Um, what would you do I'll, differently if you had to do it all over again? Well, I don't know enough about manufacturing, but I do now from, from Alex Costello, the uh, the genius behind everything here. We're kind of a circular operation here and there's a lot of running this way and then moving dough over here and then moving it back here. We would want an inline production. You know, we wanted to be straightened out and uh, just more logical. We kind of backed into this space that had been uh, Jillian's gluten-free uh, oh, yeah. production house. They're now in Salem. Yeah. I think they doubled their space. So we walked into a facility that kind of made sense, but when you really get going, you realize all the limitations of, of kind of backing into a space that was, you know, we inherited. We opened this gluten-free room in about 2019. Uh, we stamp out something around 12,000 gluten-free shells per month, I think if I have that right, 12 to 14,000 per month. And that takes manual labor. So we start over here. We have a proprietary mix that we have shipped in from California that uh, Alex formulated. And we come over here. This is, uh, this is the mix. 
has a bunch of different uh, flowers in it, tapioca, millet, and it starts, you know, formulation goes in this smaller mixer here, gets spun, it comes out, and uh, the blob of, of gluten-free mix comes in here into this hopper and then gets divided. And these sheet pans are fed like this. It goes in and you punch a button and this thing drops what we, you know, we call these pucks, these uh, 15 pucks on the sheet pan. And then this, these pucks are set here to rest for 15 or 20 minutes. Okay, they, they do rise, there's yeast in it. They come over here and follow me. And what they're doing here is setting them up to stamp them out. Now we, we are old school. This is an old cookie press. It's called the Champion Cookie Press. It's probably as old as I am, but uh, we, we re-engineered this thing to stamp out the shell as we need it. It leaves a little bit of a rim on the outside and they are manually stamp these out and they probably do this three to four days a week. And uh, like I said, something around 3,000 shells per week manually. We're still a really heavily manual operation here. Is it just the one size for the... One, one size, one yep, size. yep. And then once these are stamped out, stamped out, it's gotta be perfectly uniform. And then it's gotta have this crown remaining on it. And these will rest again and then follow me. Still resting, so everything is time and temperature in a dough plant. So it's warmer in here, you can tell it's warmer, things are gonna rise. And then Alex found these uh, Baxter ovens in Pennsylvania when we opened the dough plant. We didn't really have a need for them at the time. Maybe we'll bake some cookies. Now we use them for the gluten-free dough, some French bread that we bake off, some cookies, so these get utilized. And those shells will go in here, spin around for 13 minutes to get car baked, and then case packed. They cool and then get case packed. And then when a pizza shop, when we need them, we bring them out, top them, and uh, fire them. We, our shops, we can't say we are totally safe. We're not. Yeah, most shops don't say we're not. Really if you have an allergy, come on in. Gluten-free room, cooking it in here. Yep, bacon here. Yep. Come on down. This is the fun part over here. Yeah, that's where the action happens. There's a proofer. Let's see what's in here. I don't know if anything's in here. Nothing in there. Is that where you proof the... You don't proof the gluten-free, do you? No, the French bread that we make for some of the shops. Okay. For sandwiches? Uh, just a few of the shops make, make subs. Yeah. It doesn't really go well. Right, right, I mean, right. They just don't move. I remember we talked about that last time. You said they don't sell that great. Yeah, we did a focus group. People were like, well, we think of auto, we think of pizza. pizza yeah. yeah, which is good though. Better for you, easier for you guys. It is to not it do is. sub, but it's do... a really good sub. Yeah, you should do an auto sandwich shop. Just like just sandwiches, no pizza. You should do that. Yeah, <laughs> I'll set you up with the bread. <laughs> All right, yeah, the meatballs. <laughs> so here we are in the main production area for the dough. We do two big general piles of dough. We make dough for our auto shops. That would be our corporate units, which are 14, and our licensed units, which are 10 right now. So we feed about 24 auto units every single day with dough. And what that means is- Wait, how is many total locations do you have? 24. 14 corporate owned and 10 franchises? Yes. Yep. So what that means is the logistics behind making all that happen is something that I get careful not to take for granted. These guys make it all happen every single day. I've never got a phone call from anybody ever saying, hey, the dough didn't show up, we're out of dough, what the hell, what are we gonna <laughs> yeah. do? The dough gets there, it, like the mailman. Rain, Does each sleep, location sunshine. have plan in place in case something happens? Shitty. Yeah, a yeah. lot of, lot of contingencies. Yeah. They'll run dough around in their, in their cars yeah. if need be. Which no probably, mixers on premise though? No, 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 it's all centralized here for the control start yeah. having shops yeah, do it. Yeah, yeah. So it's all controlled here and then kind of roll forward to fix each specific problem. So what happens? Uh, people may under order dough, dough may uh, uh, may overproof so it's not usable anymore. What else? People can leave the dough out and it gets ruined. And then they, they'd get a phone call and they would figure out how to get them the replacement dough. And that means either Jared fits 42 of these trays in his, in his Corolla and zips around or somehow we make it happen. So uh, there are about 7,500, 8,000 of these white proof boxes in circulation. You're looking at some of them here. Some are going to be washed uh, back in the, the towers back there. Some are in the walk-in with the dough being proofed. And How then often a lot do you have to shops. buy new trays? I remember the bane of our existence was dough trays breaking because they're yeah. not cheap. Yeah, not they're cheap. Pretty so they're pretty expensive. They're twice as much as when you were buying them. Yeah, so oh, even what? a single unit shop buying dough trays, you have yeah. 100 dough trays. That's a lot of money. Yeah. So. I yeah. mean, here Seven you have, yeah. is even more That's money. a huge investment. Uh, I don't think we lose many in breakage, but they just get lost. They get, they may get ruined. They may get twisted. I don't know. Flour, it comes in a bag today. 
North Dakota mill, but we buy it for its gluten level and its ash level, and it may be in a different bag in the next truckload. But what's in that bag is important. The packer is just a packer. If I have it correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, Alex, but King Arthur doesn't grow wheat, they don't mill flour. What they do is they actually pack and market flour in their bag. Marketing company. Yeah. So what's he doing now? He's, uh, he's lubricating that large dough ball so it slides out of that bowl nice and easily into the hopper. We've only lost two people in that hopper so far, I think in seven years. Yeah. Or olive oil, salt, and sugar already set up so that nobody has to be doing those calculations on the fly. It's all calculated and it's predictable and consistent. What we got here is about a 600 pound batch of dough being twisted. Uh, that's gonna tip up in three minutes. It's gonna twist up into this VMAX hopper in three minutes. It'll go down and then it gets divided. And then you'll see uh, our guys taking the dough balls and stacking them in the dough trays. This bowl, you know, the friction from that dough creates heat. That dough wants to, we get it to come out at exactly the same temperature every single time. But one of the ingredients in this batch will be ice. So it's gonna be iced down in order to make sure that that dough is 66, 67 degrees when it comes out. So growing stages here, we now buy flour by the truckload, no longer by the pallet. But these guys have established SOPs on how to actually open the bag of flour, dump it, save the bag so we don't miscount, so we don't get any remnants of the flour bag in the mix. There's all these, you know, there's a lot of safety guards to make sure this happens consistently every single time. Come on. <laughs> Sometimes to watch go. Yeah, that's awesome. Just, uh, you get caught with the hands, they get in the groove. That's great. Where's he taking them now? The proof? I'm not even sure. Maybe the How are you? I'm good, oh, thanks. yeah. How are you? And then this dough all gets uh, retarded in the fridge, uh, aged for two to three days before it's shipped out to the units. What you see here, this dough here, is uh, these are gluten-free pizzas, gluten-free uh, shells that we, we started with. And then in another walk-in somewhere, we'll have our organic frozen dough. Um, by this Eco Lab uh, pass through washer. Like I said, we have 7,000 of these things that all have to get sanitized when they come back in house. Matt has been doing this for four or five years. Is he a delivery driver? No. Uh, no, I'm joking. I was just because in our store <laughs> as a delivery driver, he used to wash the dough trays. He doesn't have time to do that. Yeah. This is this, he's planted here. He doesn't move. This is all he does is just wash dough trays. Yep. And he's happy as a clam. Uh, and then they dry in here. You take a left here. Oh, yeah. Come on, you can't spin So these all have to get dried, of yep. course, right? And as I mentioned, Constantina, this building was built as a bakery uh, for a bread company based out of Maine sometime around, just around the turn of the century, 1904 or something. So we're in a, we're in a building that was designed to manufacture dough and here we are making dough. How much does each one of these dough trays cost? 14, 15 bucks, plus the lid, plus the dollies are $75, which we have a, a bunch in circulation. So there you go, you can do the math. <laughs> <laughs> this is just a small piece of it, yeah. yep. Uh, this room, this room here, this big Hobart mixer is used for making our tiramisu that we have as a, uh, as a dessert in house. Um, 80 quart mixer. This is a, this is a, everybody, everybody watching this video, this video will know what this is as an animal. I, uh, this could be 50 years old for all I know. Uh, they don't die. Keep it, keep it happy with oil and it keeps going. They last forever. So, uh, we have different different bowls for that, of course, but this is just for glute, for um, the tiramisu production. And so we have everything set up for tiramisu. This gets done once or twice a week. Um, and uh, and then I case pack, uh, pallet, palletized or case packed and then put in the fridge. And then uh, and then Brick that has some freezers, if you're interested. And we were in, in the market for freezers. I went to see him and he had had a business. Uh, he sold something on QBC and that's whatever that was, it didn't work out. So he's trying to sell his freezer. He had one giant freezer and uh, I was ready to make him an offer and he just said, I'd be happy to see somebody get make use of these things. So we got these for free 
but the cost of moving and then reinstalling them here was 45 or 50 grand. And we carved it up into a different configuration. Wow. So these are... Um, so this is a freezer? This is a refrigerator now. Okay. Um, these are these are dough balls for... Are these... Uh, medium size, so we were on uh, this small size for our medium temp right now. This is fresh dough yep. for the mass area. Okay. So, uh, you know, exit or so. And then you can see these, these, each tray is stamped on the data manufacturer, so uh, we can tie it together if we need to. For one thing, we know when it, when it was produced, if there's a problem, but it's much more, uh, uh, much more heavily used for uh, the shops to know when they receive the dough and what date they should be using it, so that it's used at its peak uh, flavor. How many days do you suggest they use it at? Five days for our formula, it five max, to six. Max seven? Can stretch to seven. It gets a little a little wonky Loose. and yeah. in a high production environment. It, the, the pizza, the dough guy doesn't want to mess around with that dough when it's when it's that loose. Yeah. To me, it's a beautiful pie, but it takes a little bit more time to open. Yeah. And uh, this is impressive. These are the balls for uh, for Whole Foods. These are the balls being blast frozen. When we produce a dough ball for to be ship frozen it's going to come down to temperature very quickly otherwise it gets crystallized moisture forms on it but the house dough is being slowed down retarded for distribution two days from now same with this dough except that dough there is going to be that's fresh dough and we deliver fresh in about half the shops and we deliver frozen in the other half of the shops because we get to a point logistically where we simply didn't have the bandwidth in one truck to move all the dough and we couldn't do it consistently uh, we couldn't do it where the product was really maintained consistency we didn't have the room to do it. We're opening units, we're as far north as Auburn, Maine, as far south as Weymouth, Mass. We expect to go further, and it just uh, it just wasn't practical to move all that fresh dough around. Fresh to frozen, Alex engineered our dough, our frozen dough, to mimic our fresh dough so closely that uh, I can't tell the difference. And uh, we haven't heard anybody say, oh geez, the dough's changed, it's different. Um, it does need to be handled a little bit differently in the shops, but it's arguably a better product. Um, because I think there is more control in that frozen dough. When the shops receive the frozen dough, they're in charge of taking and proofing it in-house. So they have more control on the timing of when they use that dough. Before, when they would receive stacks of fresh dough, maybe they get that on a Monday or yeah. a, a Thursday, and how they bled through that would dictate, like that last portion of dough, how proof that was. So I think it's a better consistent product. To the makeup line, and more fermentation means better flavor. I like it. Yeah. I was gonna say that. <laughs> All right, so we're going to bring them across the way and show them. Uh, yeah, lead the way. Next phase. So this is all part of auto, like all of this. So our space that you saw right now, that was where we currently are. That's yeah. where we're renting. Okay. The, the building as a whole, we're looking at picking up some additional, moving our space. Okay. That the open space that that it would work out. They wow. rent out our space, and this space has a little bit better infrastructure. For okay. Us. We um. We so you're moving up, the whole facility over there. We're gonna pick up the whole facility. Wow. Actually, you just missed yesterday. We had a crew of riggers come through to to you know take measurements and give us quotes on moving all the equipment over. And um, our current space, we've been picking up open rooms, kind of piecemeal and putting our production flow together. Whereas this is more of a, a blank space that we can really engineer to for a better throughput and just kind of with our eyes on growth and, right. and moving ahead. So this was a neighbor of ours. They had moved out uh, a little under a year ago now. The place had been vacant, um, but it, it had some as far as the, the infrastructure in place, it had a lot of the bones to, to really allow us to, to grow our lines and, and really look to the, to the future and what we're trying to do. This area would all be a production floor. We'd have different production lines. Everything you just walk through laid out here. You have a dough line, an inventory storage area, a, a wheat production or a dessert line, packaging line. So many of the items that you have see laid out, that's just us mocking up space where we're gonna install equipment. Well, you'd see, we're gonna hang a wall, we're gonna have our gluten-free line. You're gonna have your ovens installed over there. And then what this room did have, which was another huge benefit to us, was uh, a lot of refrigeration and freezing space on site and closer together located to our, our production line. Walk past these pallets of oil. Um, it's something that all your operators will understand because they're feeling the pain of it that we do. This oil is almost twice as expensive as it was pre-COVID. You know, we buy it by the pallet. The lower pallet costs twice that it did pre-COVID. And what does that mean? It means either we have to, it means 
there are different ways to approach it. You can either change your formula, so you use a different oil, maybe a cheaper oil, which we decided we won't do. You can reduce the oil in the, in the formula, which we didn't do. We want to keep our integrity. You can absorb part of that cost as an operator. You can absorb all the cost, or you can pass along part or all the cost to the consumer in the menu pricing. And we have balanced trying to take a 4.5% menu increase earlier this year to a point to try to capture some of the increased costs, but it doesn't come close to comparing our operating costs, raw product overhead compared to pre-COVID operational expenses. You can't, is, raise, you can't raise the prices enough to you can't. compare for the cost of each You simply can't. Industry. So where's that squeeze come from? For a company like ours, it may mean we pull back on benefits on, on our employees, which would be a last resort. It may mean, may mean we slow down expansion. It may mean we don't have the capital to be able to expand our operations of a dope plant. It has all sorts of implications. And for other operators, maybe they don't have the margin to market or even pay themselves. The pinch is really significant, and I think this next year is going to be a really hard one for operators. I think the, uh, the excess of pricing and products is probably plateaued, but the tail of that is going to continue to eat away at the operators, and I think it's going to be a, a really tough winter, yeah. I think. More flower pallets over there. You know, little things when you start a manufacturing plant didn't really factor in. We're going to need a a forklift. A forklift. Yeah. Of course, you need a forklift because you have pallets. You know, there were a lot of oops moments on our side that you just didn't calculate. And, so this uh, is a big circle. So you come in that door, that's where the deliveries go out? Yeah, we're going to continue going this way. All right, so if someone has five to 10 units and they wanted to open a dope plant, what do you think they should set aside as a monthly budget to be able to operate it? Uh, the things I would think about are you have to find a facility yep. and you want to think about your labor pool around that facility access that, that facility is their public transportation because those are the people that you will wind up hiring. Right. They're going to get, they're going to get transportation. So you need to find the right geographic location. And then does that fit in with your own schematic of where your shops are located? Um, so if, you're, if you find the location, get a rent that seems like it works for, let's just say 10 locations. I'd say you get a minimum of 2,500 square feet, 3,000 square feet. That doesn't allow you any room to really grow. Right. Uh, starting manufacturing, it's going to be a couple points higher than you think it's going to be. A dough ball cost, it used to be a penny an ounce for dough. Now it's uh, closer to 1.6, 1.7 per ounce for making dough. That gives you the dough ball. Then what do you do with it? You have to factor in all the labor of handling that dough, storing that dough. You have the flour course. You have to buy the dough trays. You have to capitalize that, that plant. And you have to have redundancies. You have to have more dough trays than you think. Right. Come up with a number of everything you think you need and multiply that whole number for the capital cost by 1.5. Be safe. Yeah. Because everything is simply more expensive. Uh, ballpark number, if I, if we were going to do a small little dough plant, the equipment in that dough room uh, that you saw uh, uh, right there is about $150,000. And that's not, like, that's you would not, need that. We need that and we yeah. use it. Um, but you do need a dough divider. Minimum is, I don't know, twenty-five or 30000 bucks for kind of a tabletop divider. Right. You need the equipment. So it's expensive. It's expensive. So that's an initial invest. What are you? What is the rent cost here for this? Because this is a big footprint. What is the cost for rent here? The rent cost $16,000 a month. Wow. Yes. And we're, we're in Lynn. Yeah. Uh, it's fairly short money per square foot. When we started, I think it was six uh, under under six bucks a foot. It's grown up to be close to eight bucks a foot. So uh, the 16000 then we have triple nets. We have the utility costs. Right. Uh, I think our, our, our electric electric bill is about thirty five hundred a month. Our gas bill is something we have to heat the thing. Um, it just goes, it goes, it never goes. ends. It's expensive. Yeah. I would put that money. I think I would put that money into opening a, an additional location rather than dough plant. If you if you have a system for yeah. producing dough in each unit, really stick to that system. Put effort into that. I would put that investment into us another another unit to yeah. produce more money. All right, so we took a tour of the dough plant now. Yeah. Question people always ask, if you had to do it all over again, would you do it the same way? And if not, like, what would you change? So the short answer is absolutely not would I do it the same way. There's, um, it'd be an encyclopedia to fill about all the mistakes we've made getting to where we are. Somehow we are here, we are alive, and we're actually profitable, good. But our path was just a mess. And it was a mess because of rash decision, decisions I may have made, decisions that weren't well formulated or thought out, decisions that had other implications. We had no idea to even ask the questions. So um, it's a really tricky business. I explained a little bit about what happened with Whole Foods. I have a, uh, an acquaintance who sells a product at Whole Foods. They crested 20 million in sales. They're still not profitable. Wow. 
the CPG consumer product grocery is really tough. And we jumped into that probably a little too quickly. Bought some big expensive equipment. Uh, favorite market with a product that we were all proud of. The, the, the thing we all agreed on, we're not gonna put out a product we don't, we don't stand on. We did achieve that. We could not do it um, efficiently enough to be uh, profitable. So you go in, unless you were in the business for a long time, you never really know. It's always kind of a learning curve. Yeah, but we, I mean, we did some of the things that we hired consultants, you know, one consultant was 3,000 bucks a day. So we felt like, okay, we're getting like the best intelligence. Was it worth it? In that case, I would say it was not worth it. Really, truly, I talked to a lot of people. Yeah. And a lot of people in our business, our industry, are very forthright and they're totally. honest and open with, with their experience. Like you are. We try. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, 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 it's, it's, in, our, it's in our nature. Uh, but the fact is, every situation is unique. This is a unique building. We have unique, you know, we're making dough, but we do it in a, a different way than somebody else would. And you factor in all those different variables and you just don't know. I, I'd love to tell you that I am a lot smarter today than, I'm, than I was then. Not so. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't make some of the same mistakes, um, uh, but uh, uh, but I'm sure I would make mistakes. Nonetheless, I have no doubt in that. Yeah. The the some of the things financially, um, you know, you can run spreadsheets. We try to drill down here every single cost to make a bill ball, and that includes the obvious ones of rent and payroll and all the raw products, the raw bowl ingredients, but we try to capture all the utilities. But then we also try to capture the time uh, somebody needs to fire up the truck and let that thing cool down for half an hour before you load it. And we try to capture, um, you know, wear and tear on the pallets and the, and the dollies and the straps that go missing and all the time it takes to wash each tray, but also the time it takes to dry it. Maybe the dishwasher is, is down for a week and he has to do it by hand. We try to capture absolutely everything. And um, we put a lot of time and effort into it, but when we use those numbers, it still didn't kind of reconcile to a point of achieving profitability. We opened in 2015. We opened because uh, Alex had a cannoli business and he was selling us cannolis and cannoli cream, absolutely delicious. Cannoli cream is 36% sugar, by the way. It's, <laughs> it's delicious. Uh, and Alex uh, had worked for uh, King Arthur and he's, He's got all the certifications of being a, uh, an expert in, in dough formulation. He asked me, he said, you guys have whatever we had at the time, 2015, maybe we had eight or 10 units. He said, you know, you're buying your dough, you're really vulnerable, you should really make your dough and it's not that hard. Well, I've had pizza shops where I've made my dough, but I never made dough for eight or 10 or right. shops. So Alex and I sat down and came up with a, with a plan. And at the volume of dough we were purchasing, on paper, you know, not much more than an app, and it looked like, well, if we invest this much, it'll be kind of a breaking proposition making our own dough, but now we'll own, we'll have control of that dough. And that number we came up with was $400,000 to initially uh, launch this dough plan. And we were fairly close to that, but we uh, inherited a former bakery facility, which got us a, a lot of the head start there. Um, so the things we didn't have to purchase, but there are also things we didn't count on. The dough, uh, the dough mix you saw uh, with the hydraulic lift um, sounds great, is great, but we put it on the floor and the floor caved in. So move it away, get somebody in there with a steel to jack up the floor. You know, I mean, just the unknowns are endless. So we did open initially for about $400,000. But operating it year after year costs more money than we calculated. It was more labor, um, it was more utility, it's just more, more, more. And uh, we started licensing our brand in 2019. Our first license unit is the terminal B at Logan. Once you start licensing um, and selling our dough to those license units, we kind of achieved uh, break even. Where we thought break even was going to be 10 or 12 units, it actually turned out to be about 16 or 17 units, I guess, until we wrote, uh, reached break even point. So we achieved break even, and now this dough plant is profitable. We sell our dough, uh, and we have to do a lot of things to, to make money. We right. make dough for our own units, our corporate units, 14 of those. We make dough for our franchisees. We make a frozen dough product for Whole Foods and, and grocery uh, sales. We make our gluten-free product that we sell to our own units. Uh, our franchisees, as well as a broadline distributor. 
and what else we do? Um, some other things. We make tiramisu here at dessert, and we sell that to our units and our franchisees. So all that, you know, put in a big mixing bowl, spun and baked, comes out to make you make you money for us. It has been a really tough grind getting here, and you know, three years ago, I mean, we were ready to close it down. It was like just bleeding too much. So. Even though we're making money now, we have a lot of money to recoup from right. those years of losses. Real quick, would you do it over again if you had to, if you could go back to 2015? Would you do it all over again? I would do it over again. Um, I would speak to I would speak to a lot more people. I would speak to people like me that have actually done it, and I didn't speak to enough of those people. I spoke to consultants. <laughs> I spoke to nobody people. who actually owned and operated a dough Nobody who sweated it. Yeah, we sweat it. That, that it takes a sweat. Yeah, so I would. I'd get a lot more direct uh, consultation from people who have actually gone through as close to what we were imagining. Thank you so much for watching this video. Hit that subscribe button. Don't forget to check out all of our podcasts over on smartpizzamarketing.com. We'll see you on the next video.